Tell me your name, child. Salty. I come from salt pans by the trident. No, tell me your name. Squab. Your true name, child. My mother called me Nan, but they call me Weasel. Your name. Ari. I'm Ari. Closer, and now the truth. Aria. I'm Aria of House Stark. You are. But the House of Black and White is no place for Arya of House Stark. And that's our introduction to the House of Black and White. The kindly man claims that he doesn't want Arya. He wants no one. But how likely is that? Arya is a pretty reckless child. Why would they take her on over, say, anyone? It seems a rather large coincidence that the acolyte they take on happens to be a powerful telepath. No, it seems much more likely that the kindly man can't actually read lies. He was expecting Arya. The House of Black and White is exactly the place for Arya of House Stark. But why? Why does this Assassin's Guild want Arya? What do they need with a telepath? Well, let's go back to the beginning and try to figure out who the Faceless Men are. Really. Faceless Men first come up in A Game of Thrones on Robert's Small Council. On Bravos, there is a society called the Faceless Men. Do you have any idea how costly they are? You could hire an army of common sellswords for half the price, and that's for a merchant. I don't dare think what they might ask for a princess. Later, Littlefinger tells Ned, if we'd sent a Faceless Men after her, she'd be as good as buried. In A Clash of Kings, Crescent thinks about the Faceless Men. They are one of the few parties that know how to produce the poison called the Strangler. And Tyrion mentions that when he was young, he dreamed about being rich enough to afford a faceless man to kill his sister. In A Storm of Swords, Salador Sand brings up hiring a faceless man to kill Melisandre, but he probably wasn't serious. And an escaping Tyrion thinks Cersei will hire a faceless man to kill him. Cersei does know about faceless men. In A Feast for Crows, she considers the cost of faceless men when thinking about killing Bronn. So it seems that the general consensus in the world is that faceless men have a high level of expertise, but have a very high cost. And this cost seems to be based on how important the target is and how difficult it is to kill them. However, this high cost comes with a high probability of success. Being an industry that demands precision, why would they take in the mentally unstable Arya? Well, Arya did come in with the coin that she got from Jock and Hagar. This seems to have acted as some sort of recommendation letter. So what did Jockin see in Arya that would make her a good faceless man? Well, let's go over Arya's time with Jock and Hagar. Back in the first Arya chapter of A Clash of Kings, we meet Jockin, Rorg, and Biter. And right from the beginning, the three fixate on Arya. The first thing they observe is Arya, posing as the boy Ari, getting in a fight with Hot Pie over Needle. Now let's keep in mind that Arya would be quite a spectacle as she's using a Bravosi water dancer stance. This would have likely been noticed by a faceless man who spent extensive time in Bravos. But actually it seems the three were watching Arya even before the fight. You see, prior to the fight, Lamy calls Arya Lumpy Head, and Hot Pie calls her Lumpy Face. Rorg later on uses both of these names on Arya. He was definitely watching her. In the second Arya chapter, Jock and Rorg and Biter's interaction with Arya goes a bit further. The Night's Watch recruits decide to take a bath, except for Arya, which likely gives away the fact that she's not a boy. And Jockin mockingly calls her Lovely Boy. Rorg and Biter try to scare Arya, but she's undaunted, and Jockin finds out she has more courage than sense. Now shortly after this exchange, gold cloaks come looking for Gendry. Arya hides though, thinking they've come for her. And in doing so, likely gives away the fact that she's important. In the third Arya chapter, Arya shows more of her fighting ability by killing a rabbit and feeding it to Jockin. And in the fourth Arya chapter, she reveals more of her identity by yelling Winterfell before fighting. So while Arya's actions show that she's fearless and somewhat good at fighting, they also reveal her identity. She is clearly a girl of importance from Winterfell who is hiding from the Lannisters. Arya loses touch with Jockin until the seventh Arya chapter. Jockin, Rorg, and Biter have come to Harrenhal, likely to find Arya. Arya is in the middle of a wolf dream when Jockin wakes her and claims he owes three deaths. Now it should be noted that Bran howls in his sleep when he has wolf dreams. So if Arya is like Bran, Jockin would have heard her howling and might know that she's a warg. If not here, Jockin may have thought it in the ninth Arya chapter when he finds her talking to a weirwood tree. Now even though Jockin is supposedly just in Harrenhal to cross off three names, he does spend time spying on Arya, or at least enough to know where she sleeps and that she's called Weasel now. Jockin does eventually reveal that he knows that Arya is Arya of House Stark. Now what's interesting is Arya only says her name once in all of A Clash of Kings. She tells her name once to Gendry. However, she tells him when she's miles away from Sir Amory's men. This means that unless Gendry spilled the beans, Jockin knows about the politics of Westeros. He knows there is a missing Stark girl named Arya who is of great political importance. And this girl may be a telepath. 
So while there's no doubt that Jockin observed that Arya was a good fighter and clever and had little fear, those qualities are actually quite common in the world. What's less common are people of great political importance who happen to have telepathic powers. It seems much more likely that it was this quality that led to Jockin's recommendation. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about Jockin's recommendation and his coin. Now on a side note, it's almost certain that Jockin stored this coin in his rectum when he was in the black cells. But that's neither here nor there. Jockin asks Arya to come with him to Bravos. However, Arya refuses and says she's going to Winterfell. And so Jockin gives her his ass coin and tells her, give that coin to any man from Bravos and say these words to him, Valar Morgulis. Now Jockin is absolutely lying when he says any man from Bravos. Bravos is a huge diverse city. It's absolutely certain that some people wouldn't like the Faceless Men. For instance, any worshipper of R'hllor. In fact, Jockin's statement is pretty much proven incorrect on the ship trip over to Bravos. Some of the crew shun Arya. So what is Jockin talking about when he says Arya can give the coin to any man from Bravos? Well, if Arya believes that any man from Bravos will do, she'll likely give the coin to the first Bravosi she meets. Now Arya says she's going to Winterfell, which means she has to take a ship since the Ironborn have Moat Kaelin. The closest port to Harrenhal is Saltpans. And sure enough, a Bravosi ship is waiting there for her called the Titan's Daughter. Now yes, Arya did a lot of wandering before that, but based on what she told Jockin, Saltpans is where she should be. And the Bravosi ship at Saltpans is awfully suspicious. First of all, Saltpans is not a major port. Ships only go there from time to time. So it's unusual that there's a ship there, let alone specifically a Bravosi ship. But on top of this, much of Saltpans has been destroyed. This means the industrial output of the city is lower, and there's even less reason for a ship to be there. On top of this, the ship's route makes little sense. The ship's captain, Ternesio Terrace, says they rounded Cracklaw Point, which means they came from the south or here on the map. They then stopped at Saltpans, which is here on the map. And after that, they said they were gonna head home to Bravos with no stops. Now, Bravos happens to be to the northeast. So why wouldn't any trader stop at the major port of Gulltown? What I'm saying is the Bravosi ship goes to an out of the way minor port and then skips the convenient major port. It seems quite possible that the Titan's daughter was not in Saltpans to make money, but to find Arya. Now what's interesting is that prior to boarding the Titan's Daughter, it seems some of the crew knows how to speak the common tongue. But once aboard, suddenly everyone can't speak it. Some of the crew shuns Arya, while others try to get Arya to learn their names. Now there's a very logical reason why they're trying to get Arya to learn their names. Later at the House of Black and White, we learn that faceless men aren't allowed to kill people they know. With no one to talk to on the ship, Arya is forced to spend all of her time with the captain's son, Denyo. And the only thing Denyo does is tell great things about the city of Bravos. Keep in mind, Arya does not want to go to Bravos. She wants to go to Eastwatch by the sea. And even when arriving in Bravos, she wants to stay on the ship. It seems Denyo is trying to change Arya's mind and get her to stay in Bravos. Now, interestingly, once the Titan's daughter arrives in Bravos, the captain gets nervous. The Sea Lord's customs officer is supposed to check the ship. And so the captain has his son lower a boat and take Arya to shore. The Titan's daughter smuggled Arya into Bravos. This is interesting as Jockin said that any man from Bravos would accept the coin. But here it seems the Sea Lord's customs officer would not welcome a faceless recruit. So Bravos is not unified as Jockin implied. It's filled with factions like any other city. The religion of the many-faced god isn't even the biggest religion. The Moonsingers seem to be. And there's a large temple to the Red God as well. The House of Black and White only has two priests, and Arya never describes any large crowds stopping by. In fact, she specifically notes that the temple was never full. So if the religion of the many-faced god is a minority religion, what are the chances that a random ship would have a captain that's a follower? So Arya went into Saltpans, a town that normally doesn't get ships, and there was a ship. And of all the cities in the world, that ship happened to be from Bravos. And of all the religions, the captain happened to be a follower of the many-faced god. It seems much more likely that Jockin arranged for that ship to be there, and that Jockin had told the kindly man that Arya of House Stark was coming. Which explains how the kindly man knows what's a lie and what's true. He knew the answer before and was pretending to have powers. Keep in mind, charlatanism is a reoccurring theme of our author's work. It's the plot of his short story Bitter Blooms and Call Him Moses. And it explains how Aaron Damphair resurrects people and much of Melisandre's so-called magic. Keep in mind, at no other point does the kindly man have impressive lie detection abilities. He calls Arya out for lying about whispering when she was clearly whispering and lying about snooping when she was clearly snooping. He calls her out for not smelling a candle when the candle is clearly scented. 
The only impressive lie the kindly man ever detected was Arya's name, something Jock and Hagar, another faceless man, knew. But if Arya is being watched, what are Rorg and Biter's role? And how far back could this watching go? Could Sirio be involved? Well, we'll go in depth about Rorg and Biter as well as Sirio in part two. And if you'd like to find out why Westeros might actually be a post-apocalyptic sci-fi world, check out The Thousand Worlds and The Thousand Worlds Book Club.